Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this forum held by Australian China Institute for Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. My name is Jing Han. I'm the director of this institute. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where we are sitting on today at various locations. In particular, the Dairaga people of the Dairaga Nation, where the Institute is located on our Parramatta South campus, and pay our respect to the, to the First Nations elders, past, present, and emerging. I came to Australia 32 years ago under the influence of my professor at Beijing Foreign Studies University. Professor Hu Wenzhong was one of the first Chinese scholars who came to Australia after Deng Xiaoping opened the door of China to the world. Under the influence of Professor Leonia Kramer, Professor Hu studied Australian literature and set up the first Australian Studies Center in China after he returned. Following his footsteps, I did my PhD in English and Australian literatures with Professor Leonia Kramer. Back then, people often asked me why I wanted to study Australian literature. And I'd always say, I've had too much to eat. Meaning I have nothing better to do. I have, I'm eternally grateful to the influence of a Professor Hu and a Professor Leonia Kramer in my life. My PhD in Australian literature has subsequently led me to a highly fulfilling career through New South Wales uh, Attorney General's Department to SBS and to Western Sydney University. I've learned about Australia and China through differences. Understanding the differences has given me a lot of insights into both countries. Here is a small example. When I was in China learning English, we learned the English word propaganda from our textbook, taught and understood as a good and positive word. So we'd proudly tell our American teachers that we were busy with propaganda. Only after I came to Australia did I realize that the word carries a strong negative connotation. And later in China, those departments with the word propaganda in their titles swiftly replaced it with publicity or public relations. However, there is a little bit more to this seemingly simple story. The English word propaganda in China comes from the translation of the Chinese word Xuanquan. The meaning of a propaganda in English is a clear and a straightforward, but Xuanquan in Chinese has multiple meanings. Apart from propaganda and dissemination, it also includes promotion, marketing, posters, and recreation. As linguists say, no two languages are the same. By application, we can say understanding the differences is vital in any international relations. The best thing about Australia and democracy is that it allows for different voices, views, and opinions. The relationship between Australia and China is anything but one-dimensional. There are many aspects to the relationship other than geopolitical tensions and impact on trade and economy. Today, we are very honored to have the two speakers who both have an in-depth knowledge of China. Michael Smith, China correspondent for Australian Financial Review and a veteran reporter on Asia and China. Dr. Jeff Raby, former Australian ambassador to China and longstanding expert on Australian China relations. Welcome to Michael Smith and Dr. Jeff Raby. And also a warm welcome to our audiences. At the end of the conversation, we will have a Q&A session. So please post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen while we have the conversation. Firstly, I would like to invite the speakers to give their responses to the following questions. In recent times, much of our public uh, discussion in Australia have a focused on the geopolitical differences between Australia and China. In your views, 
what are the common grounds for mutually beneficial bilateral relationship and what steps could be taken to achieve mutually benef beneficial relationship under the current circumstances. Michael first. That, thanks very much, Ching, and thanks for having me here. And look, I think your introduction partly answers that question, having people like you come to Australia and immerse yourself in Australian culture and this sort of people to people exchange, especially in the academic worlds, uh, really important. And, and likewise, you know, I spent only a short time in China, but I was so fortunate to sort of sort of immerse myself in, in society there, learn a lot about China, get to know Chinese people properly. Um, and the debate at the moment, it is very polarizing and some people do blame the media for that, which I guess I'm, I'm part of. And, and it does, on the surface, it does seem like there, there really isn't much common ground at the moment. Um, you know, there, there seems to be a lot of hostility between the two countries. Um, you know, obviously I, I returned um, in very unfortunate circumstances and I think that was a result of um, you know, the very um, fraught diplomatic relationship we, we have at the moment. Um, I, I was in Canberra a couple of weeks ago speaking to a lot of people there and look, there doesn't seem to be any circuit breaker in sight. It, it sort of feels like people at senior levels of the government have almost given up trying to engage. Um, I think, think likewise, China can't see any point in engaging with, with Australia at this point in time, particularly we've got sort of two quite contentious pieces of legislation um, relating to sort of national security laws and, and foreign ownership um, and the sort of agreements with, with state governments and foreign powers, they're coming through parliament. So I sort of feel like at this point in time, China can't see the point of returning our politicians uh, phone calls. They, they sort of feel like, like Australia's on the attack. So, you know, it, it's a pretty tough situation. I mean, how do we get out of this? Um, look, Jeff's the, the, the diplomat. Uh, look, I'm just a journalist, so he'll have a better idea of this than me, but it, it feels like we need to find some way to, to engage. Look, I think we've still got that people to people, those people to people links, they're going to continue to be very important. And look, it's, it's funny being on the ground in China, I probably left about almost seven or eight weeks ago now, and, and the, the relationship in, in the headlines and diplomatically has been so tense. But when you're on the ground in China, you don't notice that. I mean, all my all my Chinese friends and, and contacts used to sort of say, oh, well, our governments aren't getting on that well at the moment, are they? And they'd sort of laugh. So no one seemed to sort of take it personally. I didn't sort of experience uh, any, any hostility there. But, um, you know, how are we gonna get our two governments talking again? It's unclear how that's going to happen. We don't, because of coronavirus, we don't have those, you know, the um, sort of big international forums and, and events where, where ministers are, are meeting. Um, but I think it's going to, you know, as Madam Fu Ying said in her comments to my paper, I mean, both sides really have to sort of engage here. Um, you know, people do have to start talking to each other eventually. Um, I think there's some frustration uh, with the way that the Australian governments handled this uh, as well. I mean, I speak to a lot of people in the business community who, who, who are a bit frustrated with the way the Morrison government sort of tackled the, the call for a coronavirus inquiry. And they often say, well, why did we have to be the country that sort of stuck out necks out there? Um, and I think, you know, on, on the Australian side and, and maybe on the other side as well, I mean, we, we do need a people at senior levels with it, with a deeper understanding of China and, and um, you know, people who are willing to spend a bit more time trying to understand China and, and all those nuances. And look, let's hope next year we'll get the US election out of the way and um, um, hopefully things will be a bit more, bit more promising next year. I'm trying to find my mute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. That's so well said. And you know, yeah, it, it is currently how much hope is there. So we do really hope both sides to see the, see where we should go with the next. Um, Dr. Jeff Braby, can you say something to these questions? Thanks, Hanjing, and thanks, Michael, for that uh, excellent introduction as well. 
And in many ways, where you left it is where I'd like to start. And we are dealing with a major national problem in trying to work out how to reconfigure our relations with China at a time of very many moving parts. And none so much more so, I think, if that's the right expression, than where you finished your comments, Michael, and that is uh, a US election coming up. We don't can't guess at the result. And uh, clearly, that's going to have a very big impact on where we go from here. In many ways, Canberra's taken, I think, false comfort from the fact that over the past uh, six to eight years in Washington, there's been a very much a hardening of position on both the Republican and the Democrat side um, uh, against China and a determination to push back on China in many respects. It's not just trade uh, or intellectual property, uh, it's advanced technology, AI, uh, it's telecommunications. Uh, and we see, I think, a very um, latter day, if you like, uh, effort to reassert US global leadership um, at a time when it's severely challenged, not just by the rise of China, but now this year with the uh, pandemic and the chaotic, utterly chaotic response by the United States uh, to the pandemic and indeed Western Europe as well, or much of Europe. Um, so I would just like to put, I think, the current state of the relationship, which has never been worse, uh, in some sort of broader context and perspective. And I think what's happened is that over that period when the United States has hardened its position against China, and as the dominant power, that's quite a normal and reasonable thing to expect the United States to do. And nearly a decade ago, Hugh White foreshadowed this in his book, China Choice. And that was widely criticized by conservative elements in the media, most unfairly. And uh, what Hugh was really saying is that, look, there will come a time with China's economic ascendancy that it will begin to challenge US global leadership. Uh, a decade ago, he didn't believe that the US would willingly be vacating global leadership uh, under a President Trump. Um, but in that process, the US has decided as the dominant power not to give China a strategic space for its ascendancy, which was one of the options that Hugh uh, not only identified, but argued in favor for uh, as a way of avoiding conflict. The US has made the other choice, and that is to contain and even to push back on China. And Hugh warned that if the US made the latter choice, it would have profound complications for uh, implications for Australia. And he really doubted whether Australian diplomats and government uh, or the society were prepared uh, in policy terms, psychologically, emotionally, to, uh, to position Australia in a way that advances Australian interests in a world in which the US resists China's rise. And I think that's exactly the situation we're in now. I think Hugh predicted it almost to the letter. Of course, the detail is different, but the reality is that's where we are because some years ago, we took a very conscious decision to align ourselves very closely with the US. Um, and although we talk and spoke of strategic cooperation uh, and common interests with China, and obviously we must because we are in the most difficult position of all being so utterly dependent on China economically, and with no alternatives in sight, having, having, having made that choice, we find ourselves as an outlier. Many, many countries in the world are having trouble dealing with China's rise. It's more belligerent international posture, uh, but of course all great powers do behave badly from time to time. And we shouldn't be surprised if China does so. It's not to excuse bad behavior uh, or to deny that we need to find a way of managing it and ourselves um, hedging against it, but equally at the same time, uh, uh, we have made ourselves an outlier, whereas other countries have worked out much better than we have how to navigate our way through this. So during this unprecedented massive shift in global power, the greatest shift in global power in modern times uh, towards China from the US, uh, our diplomacy and our public policy has been wanting. And uh, I think we just need to take a hard look at ourselves in that respect. Now, the government's view, which is too cute by half, 
is that, well, Australia's done nothing wrong. Australia's just looked after its interests. It's China's behaved badly. And I think, Mark, that's what you were picking up in your recent visit to Canberra. I get that feedback or pushback from Canberra all the time. And the conclusion from that is that, well, there's nothing wrong with having bad relations with China. If China behaves badly, then we'll have bad relations. This is the new normal and we better get on with it. And of course, China's still buying our, our exports. Um, I don't think that approach really is in Australia's interests. Uh, I think the relationship with China has to be seen well beyond narrow transactional concerns. And of course, one reason why our exports are doing so well to China uh, is because of iron ore. And that's a huge strategic vulnerability we've made for ourselves. Um, and if we can't diversify markets, we can certainly diversify products and services. So the Canberra view is that uh, Xi Jinping has the Prime Minister's telephone number, will answer the call whenever he rings. And I think it behoves the rest of us to try and help identify Canberra, for Canberra, other ways of moving the relationship forward and putting it back on a um, more productive and constructive uh, footing. And one where we're able to engage with the region's biggest power. China is the biggest power. You may not like it, none of us may like it, but how do we operate in our own region uh, if we cannot even engage officially with the great power of the region? And it goes to so many things, pandemic or uh, uh, asymmetric security risks, people smuggling, um, you know, the, the, the global commons, uh, climate change. None of those issues, on any of those issues, we cannot advance our national interest unless we're able to engage with China. It's just a fact of China's weight and predominance now in the world. So I'll round this off, uh, this big picture, because I know we'll come back to these, uh, these points later, uh, Han Jing. Uh, as I say, that uh, the challenge for us is how to navigate this massive structural shift in global power in a way that advances our interests and containing China rather than engaging China is not how to advance Australia's national interests. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, um, it is a, a big question about the engaging or lack of engaging and I always a believer without engaging China, you're not going to influence China. So, you know, looking back in China when it was Mao Zedong's time and China was very shut you know, away from from the world, and you can see what had happened. So, yeah, without engagement, and there is no way to influence China. And I think it is a big question whether people can recognize that China is going to be become a, a biggest power. And so, that is a hard question for many people. Um, so, uh, we will get back to those questions uh, um, sh shortly. My first question to Michael. And uh, th this is uh, after your widely reported return to Australia from China. Now it just seems a long time ago. <laughs> so, yes. um, so, and to many people's surprise, and still, I could, you had a written interview with the former Chinese ambassador uh, to Australia, Madame Fu Ying. Uh, can you tell us the circumstances around your interview with Madame Fu Ying? Yeah, no, we actually approached her uh, for an interview way before I, I left China and, and all that happened. So um, the AF, the Australian Financial Review, we were publishing a series of uh, articles on China called the China Challenge. Look, I really wanted to get a fresh voice in our story. Look, it's quite hard um, to get access to, to officials, uh, senior officials in China. We write, rely a lot on, on foreign ministry statements and, and the global times and look I decided to approach uh, Madam uh, Fu Ying's office because she she was so involved in Australia for for so many years she was the ambassador here she was a very respected uh, diplomat people said she was quite charming she always had um, sort of fairly uh, balanced views on on the relationship and she had done a, a little bit of media in in the past um, so we approached her office and looked to my surprise they um, a week or so later, they they agreed to do an interview. Um, it was all it was sort of all done via via email. It wasn't sort of like on the on the telephone or face to face, which I would have loved to have done. Um, they did say it would take a number of weeks to to respond to our questions. So 
Um, in that time, I, of course, returned to Australia and sort of made a few headlines and I sort of assumed that she wouldn't do the interview. But um, after I got back, to, we, we contacted her office again and um, they said, no, no, we're still doing it. The, the questions are coming. So, um, you know, they, they did respond to our questions. She made some, you know, really interesting comments there about, you know, um, you know she, she was saying the relationship isn't actually frozen. Uh, both sides should sort of open up communication. So look, the signals were, were fairly positive. Um, and, and I know many people and including Jeff sort of read that as, as a bit of a positive, perhaps, you know, this is a sign China's opening the door to Australia, but um, it, it's still very hard to tell because since her comments, we've, we've had sort of these restrictions on uh, Australian cotton, there's reported restrictions on, on coal, um, and a few sort of other uh, negative remarks in, in the Chinese media about us, Australia. So it's sort of kind of hard to know, to know what's going on there. There's sort of another theory, um, particularly around what's, what's sort of happened to, to journalists in, in China, that, you know, the foreign ministry might want one thing to happen, but uh, maybe the Ministry of State Security sort of wants another thing to happen. So, um, you know, maybe the foreign ministry isn't, isn't calling all, all the shots. It's sort of hard to tell. Um, but um, look, her comments were positive, very interesting in, in terms of the timing, but um, it's hard to tell how much uh, meaning we'll have, in, uh, have there further down the track. Yes, and uh, given her high, highly influential position in, in China, as well as in Australia, and so it was, you know, like the interview was significant and her answers is very yeah. um, important as well. I so, think as, yeah, as Jeff noted in one of his columns, I mean, the Chinese media reproduced my story. So that, that doesn't uh, happen a lot. So look, that's a sign of a, of a blessing. Some, someone's approved that somewhere. And, and um, you know, she was, she was a former vice foreign minister. She, she's got a reasonable amount of influence. And look, I don't think she would have gone rogue and, and made these comments if uh, she didn't have some kind of uh, approval there. Yeah. yeah, indeed, indeed. So yes, uh, Jeff uh, afterwards wrote an article and indicated the interview of uh, Madame Fu Ying as a sign that uh, China was looking for uh, to put a floor under the uh, continuing downward spiral in the relationship. Jeff, can you elaborate a bit more on that? Uh, you are mute. You are muted. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. Look, I fully agree with with Mike. Uh, she wasn't going rogue or anything. Her comments would have been uh, uh, carefully uh, approved by much higher levels, and certainly through the State Council uh, Foreign Affairs area. And uh, the publishing publishing of her remarks in the Chinese media, as Michael said, is very unusual and uh, points to the official endorsement of what she said. Uh, Mike's correct to point out that there have been other measures like cotton, but in some ways, and, and certainly absolutely correct, that it's not just, uh, it's not just uh, China, you can add Australia and just about every other country. Foreign ministries rarely carry much weight in their capitals and uh, seldom do they, uh, do they uh, call all the shots. Um, so all that's to be expected. And a lot of these things, like say the cotton, could well have been certainly in train and would have been in train uh, before the publication of um, Fu Ying's uh, remarks. And a lot of these things build up their own momentum. Uh, as most people know, China is a highly hierarchical, vertically organized political system and signals go up and down in silos. And uh, in all bureaucracies, the silos don't communicate very much directly with each other, but China is probably one of the worst in terms of internal bureaucratic communication. So. You don't expect things to happen in a very orderly one on you know, one to one binary uh, way. Uh, but equally, you could say that following none of uh, Fu Ying's remarks, as I pointed out in my column, um, the uh, deputy at the Chinese embassy in Canberra, uh, Wang Shi Ning, uh, made his National Press Club speech. And the day after that, the prime minister, in a very, very pointed way towards China, announced a new foreign affairs legislation, which is essentially directed at universities' relations with China and uh, the Victorian government's uh, signature of the MOUs to the BRI. Um, so we clearly, we may have had our own momentum and that policy release and statement the day after the Chinese deputy's um, quite conciliatory comments 
uh, may just be in inertia within our own system, and these things do happen. But certainly if you're sitting in Beijing, it doesn't look like there's any sort of response on the Australian side to what are, I think, two um, constructive comments. And this is the nature of diplomacy. And I commented about she, uh, Madame Fu's uh, statement is that she said, well, there is no disruption to the relationship, which is patently nonsense. It, it is. But the point I make about that is so that no one loses face, just deny that there is any disruption. Uh, and so it's not a matter of right or wrong, or it's not a matter of the mindset Canberra seems to have got itself into that it's all China's doing and we're not going to do anything until China, I don't know what it's expected to do. And that, that goes to another part of the problem. We're in a tit for tat retaliatory phase, which is very dangerous and we haven't been in one before. And the last time our relations hit a low ebb was in 2009. We had the Stern Who Rio case, a lot of issues coming off the back of the iron ore wars, as I described them in my forthcoming book. Um, and a lot of issues flowing from that in the bilateral relationship to very unfortunate statements by the then Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, one on the uh, 20, um, uh, 20th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square uh, massacres and, um, and one on the uh, riots in, uh, in uh, Urumqi in Xinjiang. So all that fed, one issue compounded the other. And by late 2009, the relationship was in a very difficult place. The Australian side was being particularly hairy chested about it and had no mood to do anything to try and improve the relationship. Um, and it was actually the Chinese side that said, let's put a floor under this. And their circuit breaker was a visit to Australia by then Deputy uh, Premier um, uh, Li Keqiang, uh, arranged at very, very short notice. And in October 2009, Li Keqiang came to Australia, sat down with Prime Minister Rudd, and they wrote a joint statement on um, the future management of the bilateral relationship. An excellent statement and something I'd commend to people today. And uh, I think these are the sorts of things that can happen as circuit breakers. But Australian side needs to, I think, uh, show that it's heard, um, heard what the Chinese have said. And you can do that without making any concessions. You can simply say, you note know what they said and you welcome any steps towards uh, improving the relationship. But my strong feeling is that there are many people in Canberra these days who actually are comfortable with the relationship where it is. Um, and I think it's totally unrealistic to expect China to go too far in, um, in, in making amends without any uh, commensurate response on our side. I mean, it's a great point that you made about this um, saving face, you know, because uh, Madame Fu particularly put out the, the description like that. It's like, so everyone has, you know, steps to, to move forward. But it seems like the timing is always there, not there. I mean, always miss the timing. I mean, you, you wish that uh, that, piece, that bit was picked up and in time, and then things could have changed. But yeah, so far not yet. So it's a sort of a wait and see when the the right timing would come from both sides. It has to be both sides. So that can be really tricky. And Michael, I think this question uh, must be sitting on many people's minds because when you um, had to leave your posting in, in Shanghai, from Shanghai, and then you described it as a bittersweet farewell. And um, we could imagine the bitter parts but um, could you tell us the, the sweet parts and also if you can share some of the highlight, highlights of that during your post in China? Yeah. Yeah, look, it was a very, very disappointing way to leave China. Look, it's very disappointing. Australia is now, I think, the only country in the world, major country in the world that doesn't have uh, journalists working for Australian media outlets uh, in China, so that's not going to help sort of our understanding of, of China either. And look, it was a, it, it was a very unpleasant way to leave. The the events of that that last week weren't, um, well, they weren't weren't pleasant. But um, without dwelling on that, um, you know, I I was in China for just under three years. I felt like I was just starting to scratch the surface. I I wasn't ready to leave 
Um, it's such an amazingly diverse and, and fascinating country, sometimes frustrating. Um, and I just felt like I was really, I had a lot more to discover there, uh, a, a lot more to learn. And look, as a journalist, I think it's China's just the biggest story in the world right now. And, and to have that opportunity to work in a country that's changing at such a rapid rate, I mean, you know, at a rate that we can't even conceive of uh, here in Australia and where everything's on such a huge uh, scale, um, it, it's just sort of fascinating. I mean, I got to try traveled uh, a lot around China. I saw some really sort of unique and, and beautiful uh, parts of China. I made a lot of friends in China who I, I never got to uh, say goodbye to. So look, so personally and professionally, it was, a, uh, it, it was a great experience. And, you know, I won't be going back in the short term, but I uh, hope I can uh, get there again one day. I mean, it's so good to hear stories from you because all the reporting about your return or forced to return or the transitional lines to reporting, it's, it's never touched on your actual experiences, you know, like your, your uh, stories about China, you know, and how you were reporting and how you actually see China. So it's mm. really, do you, do you have any highlights that are while you were there? Oh, I've got to, I don't know where to. <laughs> I don't know where to start. I mean, there were, um, I, you know, I mean, I, I had some uh, some negative experiences when when I was out on the the road as a reporter. I, I did go to Xinjiang as part of a government uh, led tour. I, I sort of really didn't like what I saw there, but you know, I, I had many positive experiences. I mean, I, I got to meet Jack Maher. I interviewed Jack Maher about his philanthropy. And I mean, he is just a, you know, an incredible uh, human being and, and a sort of fascinating uh, character. Um, you know, I got to go to really quirky places like Dandong on the, the border of North Korea, where you can go out in a boat and, and um, you know, you're, you're so close to North Korea, you can, you can see people on the other side. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of terrific experiences like, like that. I mean, I, I traveled a lot personally as well to, to, to places like uh, Yunnan. And then, you know, I guess this year was the culmination of, um, of, of sort of the reporting with, with coronavirus and sort of being in Shanghai. I'm not saying it, was, it wasn't a positive experience at all, but being in China to, to witness this pandemic when no one really knew what was going on and to sort of, I, I never made it to Wuhan, but to be in Shanghai and the story sort of came to your doorstep and and um, just watching the way that, you know, the, the, the old neighborhood committee sort of came back and in, came back into force and watch the way that China handled this pandemic and cycling around Shanghai where you, you, you wouldn't see another soul. So um, that was, uh, yeah, that was sort of one of the highlights, I, I guess. Yeah. Yes, I mean, indeed. I mean, China is, is a complex story. I mean, society is a very complex society as well. So that's why there are so many sides to China. People often forget they only focus on one geopolitical differences or ideological differences. But there are many sides to, to, to China and yeah. it's a huge country and a huge nation and the culture and the history. So mm -hmm. even, I, even I have been constantly you know, surprised or fascinated by what's going on there. Mm. And so it's really good to, 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 to hear that uh, the, uh, you know, engagement the story. So, but the currently in the, in the media, you know, it's a really a lot of absence about the especially positive engagements with the child. So, and the, every day, if you read newspapers, you read the media, it seems that the tension keeps getting worse than anticipated. So the concern is what the worst would be like. So I would like to know your view um, both of you. So, Michael, maybe you go first. Yeah, I think um, the fact that you know Australia doesn't have any foreign journalists in China at the moment. That's you know that's that's a real negative for for both countries. It's a, it's a negative uh, for for China as as well as Australia. And you know, obviously, there, there's a lot of negative stories coming out of China. But when you're sort of there on the ground and you 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 get this opportunity to sort of talk to to ordinary people and and all the nuances that you get from, um, you know, just interacting with, with ordinary Chinese people in sort of remote villages and, and remote parts of China, just to gain an understanding of uh, what's going on in the country. So you, you just can't get that if, if you're not in China, you know, covering, we're at the moment trying to work out how do we cover China 
uh, if we're not there. It's extremely difficult. Obviously, you know, I have people in China I can I can call up and on and speak to, but it's really not the same. And a lot of American journalists at the moment are, are in the same boat. As you probably know, a lot of uh, American journalists have had to leave China because the Trump administration sort of expelled some Chinese journalists, and, and they're sort of trying to cover China from from Taipei and and from Sydney and and from elsewhere. So it's a real dilemma that many in the sort of China uh, foreign correspondence community are, are debating at the moment. How do you cover this sort of country when when you're not in there? You don't want to rely on just sort of foreign ministry statements uh, every day. And then, as you said, you know the, the reporting on China from outside of China tends to, to become more negative. Um, you know, you're obviously, you're, you're, the people you're talking to are, are perhaps, um, you know, people who are less friendly towards China in, in Canberra. There's, there's a lot of security concerns about China in Australia. So I guess those voices um, t end up dominating uh, some of the reporting more than it would uh, than than if you if you're inside China. Yeah. So look, I think it's really important to to have journalists there. Hopefully, we can um, get back in there sometime. Jeff, what do you think the worst would be look like? Uh, you unmute. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that, everyone. Look, okay, it's, it's, it's pretty bad now. I'd hate to think it would be any worse, frankly. And again, you know, Michael's underlined um, in passing my point about we've made ourselves an outlier. Uh, any major country has its cadre of journalists and uh, news organisations present on the ground in China. It's you know, the biggest story in the world at present. Um, it's the uh, second biggest economy in the world on uh, nominal uh, US dollar GDP measures and on purchasing power parity, it's already the biggest economy in the world. It shapes regional politics, security, all of those things. So um, I think it's pretty bad now. And I hate to contemplate really getting worse, but without being a naysayer or a Cassandra, uh, we kid ourselves if we think our iron ore sales are going to continue where they are. Uh, whatever the growth rate of the Chinese economy. Um, we've increased our iron ore uh, share of the seaborne trade to China to 80%, 8 zero. Historically, it's never been more than about 70%. So there's at least 10 percentage points reduction in our iron ore sales that will take place, whether our relations are good or not. But um, uh, in, in 2012, 13, 14, we were down to 52% share of China's seaboard iron ore trade. We could easily go to that level. And a 30 basis point, a 30 percentage point reduction in our iron ore volumes to China will have a tremendous impact uh, on the Australian economy. So we've benefited from the fact that the Brazilian big producer Vale has had two very major tailing dam failures. And the Brazilian government's made a complete mess of handling COVID. 19, but at some point production will, will come back on stream from Brazil. They have uh, Vale Max super tankers that have been built to supply the China market. They're waiting to be used. And then there's a uh, massive Chinese investment in the um, uh, Samadu mine in Guinea, uh, which will eventually come on stream. So we are terribly exposed. Um, and so if you don't have any official contact, uh, what could be worse? Well, we've benefited from still strong Chinese demand for our exports, but that's largely on the back of iron ore. And I think sometimes we don't realize how incredibly vulnerable we are with respect to iron ore. Uh, iron ore is the most plentiful mineral on the face of the earth. You just need transport to get it onto ships. Um, and China's very good at building transport. So uh, I can see a very concerted effort to diversify uh, sources of supply of iron ore away from Australia. Yeah, um, it's so important, as Michael mentioned, that, that have the real stories coming from China because people here in Australia and often hear sort of a one side of the, about China only, so they don't really see many other sides about China and about the relationship. So Jeff, you know, uh, being a diplomat and from a diplomatic point of view, 
how do you think that Australia can, um, you know, front and keep the balance you know, be, be between protecting national security, uh, combating foreign interference, and taking a stand uh, on international human rights, as well as in the meantime maintaining effective relationship with 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 China? Yeah. Look, on the f uh, on the point that was just made before I turn to those Han Jing, um, one of the most difficult things I found. I've been involved for nearly 35 years reporting on, analysing, uh, diplomatic reporting from China, uh, briefing ministers in Canberra, writing submissions, the whole thing over 35 years uh, dealing with Australia-China relations. One of the most difficult things is for uh, people who are making decisions in Australia, either in business or in government, uh, to have a contemporary modern understanding of China because the pace of change over the past 40 years is astonishing, unprecedented, whatever um, superlative you want to use, they still fall short, fall short of the reality of what's happened. And so to Michael's point, um, it's very, very difficult to get policy in the right place unless people are well informed and not having a media presence is a very, uh, a very uh, uh, harmful thing for Australia's interests. Um, on these other points that you raised, uh, foreign interference, China's bad behavior generally um, in many ways, um, intelligence collection, um, all these are things we have to deal with, with a power that's grown strong beyond anyone's imagination and more quickly than anyone understood. Um, but what I think is extremely important, and I argued this it was a substance of my uh, La Trobe University oration last October. What we need when we approach these things is a sense of proportionality and context. What's the context in which we're finding things happening and how and what is the scale? And I don't think it's helpful when you know, spokespeople for the intelligence community um, uh, make um, unsupported assertions that the Chinese are in every level of government, every level of business, everywhere, uh, we're being overrun. Um, and the drift into McCarthyist type of language is extremely unhelpful as well. There are China threats, but we have seen in Australia in the past few years, a China threat industry develop, where think certain think tanks, certain individuals, um, and a, a number of government agencies have prospered from the China threat and have been able to attract substantial resources. Now, I don't disagree that they may have needed more resources, but again, proportionality, how serious, how big. And I always say, look, uh, how many bodies have we got? Since that Four Corners program on the China threat three years ago, basically launched off this current period of intense xenophobia in Australia, I can only count about three bodies that have that have, that have been been caught in all this time and you may even maybe five and you may even you know debate whether they're fair game or not uh, or how significant or influential were they and the other point i'd make is that yes we have to harden our defenses whether it's cyber um, whether it's intellectual property theft whether it's unfair collaboration or one-way collaboration in higher education institutions and research bodies we have to harden our defences, but that's something different than seeking to prosecute a China threat. Um, so we need some more resilience, but we don't need to panic or, or, or scare ourselves into actually harming our own interests in doing so. Um, so I, I think we have to have an open debate, acknowledge it, um, but keep a sense of proportionality and context around it and do what's necessary, but we don't have to do more than what's necessary. And the last point I'd make, and I think it's missing entirely from this discussion, is reference to the strength of Australia's institutions. Whatever the China threat, whatever the scale of it, it hasn't undermined the parliament, or parliaments, if you include the states. The media is, is, is as anti-China as it's ever been, so clearly it's been unsuccessful there. Um, every point you look at, uh, rather than somehow producing uh, supine um, conformance by Australia to China's will or bending of Australia to China's will, we actually have the opposite in spades. Um, 
So again, I, I would say some context around this helps also. Yeah, I can't agree with you more about the um, the proportion and oh, you know the strong resilience of our systems. So yeah, it's often it's a truth is told, but it's only uh, one part of the truth, not the whole truth, and not the whole thing about those uh, about China either. And uh, often people forget about uh, you know how strong the demo democratic system here and the due diligence that uh, every organization is taken. And you know we we should take more diligence, but due diligence, but that doesn't mean we should stop any connection. And often people say that uh, uh, China jump to the shadow and often feel like, do we jump to the shadow? You know, <laughs> what have they done or what they have done? Is is it so significant that what should scare us to pieces and not having any connection with the China? So yes, it is a um, question and uh, debate should be happening in the public because currently it's purely about China threat, nothing else. And so that comes back to Michael's not being on the ground reporting uh, about China. And Michael has mentioned that there are so many negatives, you know, or, you know, the, the negative points, especially about the negative stories coming from China without it being there. So my question on this is, um, you know, uh, because these days there's a technology, lots of things online, especially COVID-19 put us everything online. Do you still find possible though um, contacting uh, people in China through um, you know online, and do you find them equally open to you uh, same way as you were with them on the ground? Oh, I don't think it's ever. It's never the same when you're not there on the ground. And look, particularly in China, as you know, you know that face-to-face -face relationships and and having a meal together and um, it, it's really important. I mean, luckily I had a few years there so you have time to to build up some relationships but I suspect over time when you're just sort of on the phone or or on WeChat it's 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 not going to work so well so that that could uh really really be a problem and um, um I think the other problem though I mean I did notice in the last 18 months or, tw or 12 months people in China were more reluctant to to talk to me as a as a foreign journalist it was getting much harder to uh report uh, in in China, and, and I know a lot of other correspondents have have had the same issue. I mean, we had, you know, we had economists and academics that that my newspaper had been speaking to for sort of more than ten years, and we'd ring them up, and they'd suddenly sort of go, we, "We're not allowed to talk to you anymore." Um, so, th and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One one is, um, you know, that the political atmosphere in China it leaves less scope for for a diversity. Of opinion, but but also I think um, some of our context just assumed we were going to write a negative story because they'd been reading the Australian media and the, and the sort of anti you know a lot of a lot of anti-China headlines. And a couple of people did say to me, "Look, we don't want to talk to you because we think no matter what we say to you, um, our words could could be twisted a bit." So I think you know you can blame china and and the political situation on that but you could maybe also blame um the way china's sort of being portrayed in the west so it is getting harder to get that access and and to get people to speak to you than it than it probably than it used to be yeah. i suppose it's probably even harder if you have to record what they say now i can imagine that there would be say no 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 recording you know no names <laughs> yes yeah. i mean a lot of you know a lot of people we speak to we we don't use their real names or we you know it's it's off the record off, often and look that happens in Australia as well people don't always want their um, you know e everything out there and and look the off the record reporting is really important sometimes to mm -hmm. to find out uh, what's going on I mean my favourite reporting in China was um, going out on on the ground on the road and you know I obviously had a translator and you just um, sometimes no one wanted to speak to you. it could be very frustrating and. And um, one of my last reporting trips, I went to Sharman to do a piece on the sort of seafood industry. And look, everyone there wanted to talk to us. All the seafood traders were were very chatty. And, you know, we had some quite hilarious um, sort of moments with them. So, you know, you get a real um, a mixture of responses as a journalist in China. I think of this uh, real stories is very encouraging because, you know, like people often see that China doesn't move. China has been a communist country. I mean, China has been a communist country since 1949. 
But if you compare China in 1949, in 50s or 70s to China today, it's a very different. You know, if you were in China in 70s or 60s, no one would dare to speak to you. So, you know, so that has improved and that has, you know, the differences are made and you hope, you know, so I think this is the interaction with the world. And then the more China, Chinese people know about the, the responses from the world and the more likely they may change, you know, they may uh, actually move to the direction that a Western countries would like them to move. Mm -hmm. mm, so next question is really- Angie, Angie on that point, if I could just say, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think um, there's something that is, is is happening in the external view of China uh, to that point. I mean, there's no doubt, as Mike was saying, that it's harder to talk to people and get them on the record in China. There's greater sensitivity, and there's greater um, there's greater control internally. And, and in a sense, what's happening is it's like a, under Xi Jinping, a shadow has been drawn across the country. But it's not impenetrable and it's nothing like the blanket that used to be across China uh, in the period that you're just referring to, where you, you absolutely couldn't penetrate what was going on. Um, and I think these things wax and wane. Um, in our discussions about China, we often forget the fact that uh, it, has, it has been through uh, much more repressive and dark periods and was much less uh, penetrable. Um, and, and, and it's been quite open. And even today, more Chinese people than ever have traveled overseas, have contact with foreigners, know what the outside world's about, have VPNs and can get around the great firewall to go onto you know, Facebook or Google or whatever. Um, it's, it, it's, it's not closed in the way that people often imagine, uh, despite the increasing repressiveness of the Xi Jinping period. That's right. So, so true. Because, you know, 70s or 60s, and then we had political studies and all sorts, and no one could talk about it. You wouldn't dare to talk about it. But these days, people often joke about it. You know, you hear them to say, oh, I have to do these political studies. You know, so they joke about it. And the fact that they can joke about it, that they can joke about this, and they can joke about political issues, they can even joke about the political leaders, you know, state leaders. That's huge difference, you know, um, has been made from where the China was in the 70s. So it's, yeah, it's not not impenetrable anymore. Um, so the next question on the on the on the uh, economy, which in both of you was um, a strong point. And um, in, because I really want to touch on this um, uh, escalating trade tensions with China, the, some long term, you know, like a short term, as uh, Jeff has mentioned, uh, Australia or China could not much could not see much, you know, um, impact. I mean, not huge impact, but the long term damages to both. What do you think of the long term damages to both Australian economy and China's economy? And will Aust uh, China continue being Australia's? A largest trading partner, given the diversity that uh, Australia is taking now. Uh, that me? Like to yeah. Go there. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, Jeff mentioned iron ore before, and, and iron ore is obviously our key, the key export for for us. And and yeah, I think I think Jeff's right. I mean, I think at the moment iron ore is pretty looking rock solid in in the short term, but um, but but longer term that that might not last forever. There's going to be alternative sources of supply look it's hard to say i mean i think two-way trade now is is around 240 billion annually so this, you know it's at record highs um whether we can see that continuing it it it, it doesn't seem that likely i mean we we've had um you know we, we've had restrictions on a on a, a number of products and and barley maybe wine um you know possibly a bit of a bit of coal um, at the moment, that's sort of just really chipping away on the sidelines, sort of putting a bit of pressure uh, on the on the Australian government. I mean, as as a whole, it's not going to send our economy crashing, but um, but I think there is a bit of an assumption in Australia that uh, we're going to keep riding high, you know, in terms of China. We're going to you know keep selling billions of dollars worth of products to China, and you know, and maybe we we shouldn't assume um, that's the case. I'm not sure. I mean, particularly if China, Chinese tourists and students really do stop coming here, that that'd have a huge effect. Look, that's hard to 
measure up at the moment because of coronavirus. We don't know whether people would actually, you know, no one can come anyway. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens in, in the next year or so. Um, and not forgetting that the Chinese people want our products. Chinese people want to come to our universities and and come here as tourists. So the Chinese government has the power to stop that if it wants to, but it's probably not going to do anything that really up upsets its own consumers and its own people. And I mean, even some of the, the, the restrictions we've had on um, Australian products to date, you know, you, you look at barley, maybe cotton. I mean, these are things that might have happened anyway. I mean, China arguably doesn't need all our barley anymore. It can get it from, from the US and other sources. So it sort of seems to target products that it doesn't really need um, anyway. If, if, if it really wants something, it's going to keep uh, buying it from Australia. But I think this talk of sort of decoupling from China, I mean, if we do that, obviously, you know, our economy, economy's, um, you know, really not going to survive. But I, I think Australian businesses are, are a bit nervous. They are worried about sort of political interference and they will look to diversify more than they might have um, 12 months ago. But, um, but it's going to be hard for them to find markets sort of th this big. So uh, China's going to continue sort of to be really important to us. Jeff? Yeah, well, on that last point, that's the geostrategic reality that we can't get away from. I mean, all this talk about finding alternative markets and so on. We trade what we trade with China because of the profound complementarity between the two economies. This was understood back in the early 1980s when Bob Hawke and Roscano um, started to develop policy to engage with China. Uh, they were often regarded as wild optimist. The reality is that China in this respect, in terms of uh, its importance for Australia economically, has far, far exceeded their wildest optimism. No country is going to replicate China as our largest trading partner of this scale. Um, so there we are. And so we have to work out how to live with that reality. It may be an unpleasant truth, but that is the truth. Um, and politicians, I think, need to be a lot more honest with the Australian public. Uh, we trade what we trade, not because we like China, not because we want to trade with China. We have no option. And if we wish to trade less with China, then the politicians need to be honest with the public and say how much our living standards will decline. We have the option. If we see that China is such a threat to our security and our interests, then um, it's up to the politicians to say how much it's going to cost us uh, to protect ourselves against that threat. Um, another point I'd make on this, and I find it quite disturbing, is that the China threat industry, as I call them, have completely delegitimized economic interests in the bilateral relationship or economic interest in having a good bilateral relationship. It's been quite a remarkable thing. And Australian business is largely mute. They're mute because uh, they fear that if they actually come out and argue for commercial economic interest in the relationship, they'll be accused of putting their own personal private interest ahead of uh, national interest. But it has to be said, and it's never said enough, that the cornerstone to national security is economic security. And the policy dilemma we have is we get our economic security from China, just as we see China as a threat to our national security. So we have to unpackage that puzzle. Um, and again, return, I think, to policies of engagement, not, uh, not containment. So in the long term, as it is now, we will be utterly dependent on China economically unless we make a decision and a conscious decision to substantially reduce our living standards. And I don't think with massive budget deficits looming as a result of COVID-19, governments are going to be in any mood to talk to the Australian community about reducing our living standards. Um, I think one other point I'd add to what Mike has said, and again, I don't think there's enough attention being paid to it, through the firm, we are sort of scaring Chinese inward investment away from Australia. And we saw the most extraordinary decision by the treasurer a couple of weeks ago, where he blocked the sale of a Japanese owned dairy asset to a Chinese dairy company. One foreign company owning an asset selling to another foreign company. Uh, and I have not 
I come to grips with the fact that cows uh, and farms have become national security issues. So this is getting to a point where it's bizarre, but imagine how that's viewed in China and read in China. The only message you can take away from that is that Chinese investment in Australia is unwelcome. Now, China has massive capital reserves uh, and it's in the process of even further liberalizing its capital account. Um, are we going to deny owners of Australian assets the value that would come from allowing Chinese investment in the country? I think there are already some very substantial costs. And I think the views and attitudes in China towards Australia as a place with which to do business and especially invest uh, have become completely um, soured by this, uh, the state the bilateral relationship is in. So um, there are big issues to, to address, but they all end up uh, looking like uh, Australia might be uh, poorer uh, because of it. Do you also think that, uh, you know, damage to, 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 to China, uh, the way that they do uh, retaliation? You know, are they damage to their reputation in the international setting? Yeah, for sure. Uh, economic coercion is a very poor policy option for the Chinese. Um, and it's counterproductive in every respect. Uh, I wrote an AFR column on this a couple of years ago before the issues in our bilateral relationship got to where they are uh, with respect to other countries uh, where China had attempted economic coercion and said that now China was a great power, it's about time it had a grown up foreign policy. But I think, and I'm not making excuses for this, but it, Beijing sees economic coercion as one element of its statecraft. Uh, and it's largely, I think, because China's um, instruments of statecraft are quite limited. And in particular, in my view, China has completely, in the modern age, uh, failed to project its soft power. So its capacity to influence through soft power is minimal. And there are reasons about, uh, for, we can go into that. Um, and so, unfortunately, elements of uh, its statecraft, such as economic coercion, become seen in Beijing as being more important uh, and worth the effort, uh, despite the um, counterproductive nature of the consequences. I mean, this uh, counterproductive is really, uh, should be a strong message to, to China especially if they are going to be, you know, a great, a great power in the, in the world. Um, so from both of you, um, what, what would you say to, to China? We have, we have said a lot about Australian, Australian government or Australian media. What would you say to, to China? What things are that they, you think that they should be doing to be uh, constructive rather than counter? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, to follow up on, on Jeff's comments, I, I don't think China is doing itself any favours by sort of embarking on this sort of campaign of, of economic coercion. It's it, obviously, you know, no one ever confirms this is actually happening, but we sort of all, all know it is. And I mean, China wants to be taken seriously on the world stage as, as, as a great power, as a great trading power. So you could argue, well, you know, other countries don't, don't behave this way. And... Um, so, so, so why, why should you? I don't think China's done itself any favours since coronavirus with this sort of wolf warrior diplomacy uh, that, that we've all heard a lot about. I mean, that's, I don't know, it seems to be tailing off a, a little bit at the moment, but sort of this very aggressive response to, you know, claims around, around coronavirus and, and aggressive comments about how other countries were, were handling the pandemic. I mean, that that just sort of annoys uh, everyone. So, so diplomatically, there seems to be. I mean, you speak to a lot of sort of China watchers, and everyone's a bit confused as to why is China sort of picking fights with with sort of multiple countries at at, at the same time. So, you know, I think in you know, you know, I think in terms of that sort of perhaps they need need to rein their diplomats uh, back in and, and sort of be be a bit more diplomatic and. And in terms of Australia, I mean, it, it would be nice to, um, you know, to see China in, engaging with Australia as well, whether it's, it doesn't have to be at a prime ministerial level, but you can start a bit further down the chain and, and sort of 
maybe answering the phone at maybe a trade ministerial level and and sort of getting some some kind of dialogue uh going i mean i think um as we were discussing before there's 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 some sort of china writers weeks uh events uh sort of online events in in beijing and and there is a bit there's obviously a bit of contact uh and communication happening there so not so not all the doors are closed but um but maybe it'd be nice to see the global times um down you know tone the rhetoric uh down a little bit and, and maybe that's probably not going to happen but but maybe start there very good point yes and yeah. um, uh, i'd agree with michael very much on that i think uh, china needs like they keep saying to us uh we need to moderate we, we need to control our, our our public commentary and our rhetoric china needs to do the same and uh uh this downward spiral is not going to change until both sides exercise discipline over their public statements about each other. Um, I think China also um, needs to try and become a more confident nation. I mean, a lot of what we see, uh, wolf warrior diplomacy or the use of economic coercion or so on, comes from an abiding sense of insecurity uh, from its history, from the century of humiliation. And just because we could all laugh about the way the century of humiliation uh, is used by the Chinese Communist Party to legitimize its position and it's in all the propaganda um, doesn't mean that it, it didn't happen and the Chinese people still feel that very much today as the old cliche goes just because you're paranoid doesn't mean you're not being followed and um, and I think you know this is a very important thing for China to understand that the Chinese state is recognized uh, nations aren't trying to undermine the legitimacy of the Communist Party, uh, that uh, we understand and recognize China's interests, and China needs to reciprocate um, by recognizing that uh, it needs a more constructive, engaging foreign policy itself and not seek to make the world some sort of um, safe place for the Chinese Communist Party. There will be criticism overseas of aspects of how China behaves, so there should be, and China needs to accept that that's actually normal in affairs between nations. Um, yeah, um, time has gone so fast. I think the last point I really want to make and to pick up um, Michael's point about the engagements, are that, you know, I guess some engagements are not being reported, but still they are ongoing and they're going on, which is quite important in this uh, um, well, uh, Chinese uh, China Writers Association is uh, partnering up with us to hold a uh, Chinese Australian Writers in Dialogue and in December. So, and there is also uh, Australian Writers Week in Beijing uh, as well. So, you know, there are um, uh, cultural arts um, engagements that are happening and hopefully the political engagement, I mean, engagements in between governments uh, should be happening as well. So then, you know, there would be no such instances that uh, no one would pick up the phone. I mean, if you have no engagement, who would pick up the phone from where? So it needs to come actually from the context and that has been consistently going there. And I really want to thank you both for your great, uh, for the great conversation. But I think the audience have been waiting for a while <laughs> with their questions, and especially the first one posted uh, the right at the beginning. So. Let's come to the questions from the audience. I think the first question is for Michael, and uh, I think she would like to know about the uh, news, uh, being a journalist, uh, you, you are being journalist. Given the current climate of bilateral relations between Australia and China, journalists, especially foreign correspondents, might have limited access to the first-hand local news when uh, they are not physically based, when you are uh, not on the ground. Therefore, uh, she assumes that many of the journalism will, to a certain extent, rely upon news information from a foreign source in another language. So how could you make sure that accuracy of a news report, a news that are being translated from other, another language, how can you make sure that it's accurate? Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I mean, if the the news is coming from sort of state media or, or in China or the, the foreign ministry, um, you know, if it's on Xinhua, we, we normally assume that's that's accurate because it's come 
sort of directly from from the government, it, it would have been vetted. We obviously, you know, we have a translator. You know, we work with translators. We uh, we have a translator uh, in in China who's um, very trusted. So you know, I, I think we're getting accurate translation and 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 an accurate source of news. And obviously, there's also a lot of there are a lot of foreign journalists still in China. It's really only Australia that that doesn't have any. There, there's a lot of journalists for Bloomberg and Reuters and there's hundreds of European journalists still in China uh, and some very good reporting uh, being done. So, you know, th th there are some sort of reliable sources of news still coming out of China, both from from foreign, uh, you know, overseas uh, agencies, as well as sort of state media and, and the Chinese government as well. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I think the next question probably Jeff would be the best person to answer. And it's about COVID-19 investigation to the origin, you know, um, Australia that started the independent investigation. And the question is, uh, I think this is really a face issue, you know, face saving issue for, for China. And if the reactions could have been predicted, knowing that would it be a face issue, would Australian government do the same? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> um... And, and 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 you can see it hasn't sort of been repeated in, in in the way it was when it was initially announced but or called for but let me make a point on this face is such a big thing in china it's a big thing for everybody but it's a very big thing in how you inter interact with people um and we have not once but on my count at least three times un unconsciously but effectively gone out of our way to make China lose face. The first one is the banning of Huawei. We were the first country and the only country until very recently, and we're talking now uh, that several years ago, to have comprehensively banned Huawei from every aspect of the 5G. We didn't have to be the first, we didn't have to do it in such a public way, and we didn't have to do it completely comprehensively. Uh, but if we had to do it comprehensively, we should have done it in a way that did not make China lose face. Uh, uh, the second one was uh, with the anti-foreign interference law. I mean, I think that law should have been brought in years ago and the politicians need to explain why it took them so long to, inter to introduce such a law. But having done it, it should be non-discriminatory. But the way Malcolm Turnbull during the Benning Long election campaign uh, spoke about it, including speaking in his Chinese about Adalia uh, and Zhang Chi Lala uh, uh, was, was deliberately, absolutely made China lose face. And, and, and effectively saying the only issue with foreign, anti, foreign interference we have in Australia is China. Um, and then of course, the third one is the coronavirus and how that was called for. Um, and it didn't have to be that way. And I don't know how we ever discipline our politicians to understand that what they say in a domestic situation for largely short-term domestic uh, objectives plays out internationally and in an already tense and difficult relationship that we have with China uh, is fuel on the fire. And we can achieve the same national objectives by doing things differently. And again, I think the politicians involved need to be held accountable for this. Mm. It's really come down to the question of understanding and the knowledge. If they do have understanding of the Chinese culture or China better, there are better ways of dealing with the situations like that, and you achieve a better, you know, outcome. So I often think that you know, the, isn't it outcome is the measurement of a success of, of action. Next a question from Helen is, which is actually I would like to ask uh, um, in the first place. And the Michael, um, you know, we talk, you talked about people to people uh, link so important. Uh, would you like to elaborate more on to general people, you know, generally how people do in such, such current circumstances, what they should do to enhance these people to people connections between the two countries? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you're probably more involved with that side of things than me. I mean, academic links and like the, the writers festival events you're you're very involved in i mean they're they're terrific and we we all have you know probably everyone here has personal relationships um you know, friendships with with people um you know i have chinese friends and you have a, friends who are you know born in australia so i think think 
think that all um, helps. But obviously, at the moment, it's pretty tough to enhance those people to people links because we can't go to each other's countries uh, unless it's in sort of really special circumstances. So until the borders reopen again, that that's going to be pretty tough. But I mean, I mean, I think Australia tried to do this with, with having the AFL games in in China. I don't know how successful th that was, but that that was a good example of sort of trying to sort of bridge, you know, make cultural bridges through through sports. So, um, you know, there's still many things we can do. If I may, Hanji, on this, I'd like to make a suggestion, sure. which I probably should have made earlier. And that is, I think it'd be fantastic if the Chinese embassy, through their cultural budget, would support a major retrospective of Chinese Australian artists in Australia. And hopefully with a view when people can move around, touring it back to China. But as a first instance, uh, there are so many great artists here. Uh, Western Sydney and, and, and the Centre have done, an institute have done a lot to uh, uh, promote uh, their work. But it would help to put the 35, 40 years of bilateral relationship during the opening period um, into historical perspective. Um, and we have all the materials, we have all the artists, uh, pretty much all in Australia. Uh, and this could be done with not a huge expense, but it would be a tremendous gesture of goodwill by the Chinese government if the embassy could support such a project. Great idea. And also, it's so important to look at the things in retrospective. People often forget that, uh, you know, the relationship between China and Australia have been quite healthy and quite beneficial. And it has been like that for a long time. So China is not new enemy. Often the media portrayed like a China becomes a, our new enemy. I mean, China has been there for a long, long time. And we have, you know, got along very well, beneficial. And arts, as you mentioned, the Chinese and Australian artists, so they are amazing and brilliant. You know, in, integrated the Chinese art, art uh, with Australian and Western artists as well. So a great achievement. I should really approach them and to make that proposal. And the next question coming, and I think Jeff, you mentioned, uh, both of you mentioned about the Biden. If a Biden wins the election, what what would be the, um, the crucial difference to make to Australian-China relations? Because you didn't really elaborate on. Well, thanks for the question, Colin. Um, uh, I wasn't clear then if you asked that question because I made two points. One was that both sides of US politics over the last six to eight years have hardened their position against China uh, and have uh, both support China as a strategic competitor. Um, the other point I was making is that after the election, no matter who wins, there could well be a change and a reset of the US policy towards China, partly because uh, what's been happening doesn't seem to have worked very well, um, and partly because decoupling or whatever may well play to China's strengths and impose costs that the US may be unprepared to, to bear. As specifically for Biden, um, I think you could characterize his current writings about how he'd managed the relationship as a combination of uh, strategic competition and strategic cooperation. Competition bilaterally in technology, trade, intellectual property, uh, cooperation on the global commons on things like uh, pandemics, uh, climate change, and so on. You certainly wouldn't have, oh, and in the WTO, I think, restoring, rebuilding the WTO after the damage that the Trump administration has done to it. Um, but I think one thing, and this is just a hunch from my perspective, I think Biden will be less interested in Asia and more interested in, in Europe. I think he will emerge as a more of an Atlanticist president, partly because he's going to have to do a lot of work to rebuild the alliance relationships with Europe, individual Europe states, and then collectively with the EU and NATO. And they have a major problem with Russia and they have to somehow work out how to fix Russia because ironically, uh, what they've done is strengthen China by imposing sanctions on Russia in response to its bad behavior in the Ukraine and the Crimean and so on. 
and uh, poisoning various people to get in the way of the Putin administration. Um, what they've done, though, is, is given Russia no options but China. And China has sucked that up. That's a big market for Russia's energy. The more Germany is pressured by the US not to buy Russian gas, the more Russian gas will end up going to China and the more influence China will have across Eurasia. And my view, as I argue in my, my new book, is that China is now the dominant power in Eurasia. From Beijing to Warsaw, China dominates. And I think this is a big problem for the US and, and Europe. And so they have to work out how to somehow bring Russia back to Europe and away from China. And that's not easy, but it will go down very much to the strength of the alliances of NATO. So I think it's going to be a very complicated, very complicated set of foreign policy considerations. But by and large, from a Biden perspective, the alliances in, in Asia are pretty good. US, China, US, Japan, US, South Korea, the main ones, of course. Um, so uh, I do think, though, there will be a reset in the US by uh, China bilateral relations, no matter who's president, uh, a couple of years into the uh, term. Mm. The only thing I could add to that is that um, China might prefer Biden because he's more predictable. I mean, Trump's just so unpredictable, so erratic. They they don't know what they're going to get from day to day. And and you know, as we know, China's leaders like stability. So I think that's all I can really add to to what Jeff said. An interesting point, though, Michael. The alternative. An alternative view is that um, Biden will be much harder on human rights. Mm. And I mean, clearly, I think uh, China is very comfortable that uh, Trump hardly mentions human rights. Uh, <laughs> it's totally yeah. transactional, the yeah. art of the deal. And that, that's in China's space. Mm. I mean, if, if it's just a matter of a few billions and billions of dollars of goods or trade, they can deal with that. Mm. Human rights challenges them more fundamentally. Yeah. And I suppose also Trump changed his mind easily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That could be a, a good sign. But what do you think to Australian, though, if, if Biden wins? You know, would it be good for Australian improving Australia's relationship with China? <laughs> yeah, well, we probably will, we'll, 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 it'll take us a while to work out what's going on. Um, and when we do, we'll, we could well be for a while uh, punished by China. Uh, we have a comment from Louisa Guest, and she was very pleased with this uh, uh, session and particularly said, uh, Michael's, uh, it was fascinating to hear Michael's background story that provides a context to recent events and also uh, to Jeff's unpacking of the issue as you know, in, in, in so lucid and enlightening. We have a question from uh, Kevin and then one more question. Um, to some extent, the Australian government's one-dimensional approach to China seems to reflect the growing hawkish public discussion of China in Australia. What, if anything, can be done to encourage a more balanced and nuanced public discussion of China in Australia? Who wants to go first? Uh, it's a million dollar question. All I can say, Kevin, is uh, uh, people go out and buy my book and read it. It's <laughs> 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 a good plug. Well done, Hanji. <laughs> and we are going to have a book launch anyway in, uh, in December. So we will send out the invitation to everyone here. And so you will hear more uh, about the book from, from, my, uh, from Jeff. Uh, Michael, would you like to answer Kevin's question in a way? You're probably not a lot more to add than uh, than, than what we've, we've discussed, and I guess it's this ongoing problem for China in terms of projecting its its soft power. It ha hasn't been that successful. It's tried to um, sort of grow its media outlets here, and and of course now with the debate the way it is, if if China tries to do that, then it's being accused of doing something sort of far more sinister. So it's in a bit of a uh in, in in a bit of a tight spot so look um you know again i think it's all the things we've covered the the people to people uh interactions the stories uh the, the sort of alternative stories about china from from reporters on on the ground there and um you know if if people are meeting people who are from china and learning about their culture that's you know that that always helps mm. 
Uh, in relation to this question, Jocelyn has uh, said, uh, Lowy Institute reported massive decline in public perception of China. And even if a positive responses are made to Chinese offers of Oliver Branch, or you know, people to people exchanges are instituted, will they be able to change this public negativity about China? Do you think? It's going to be hard for a while, and there's obviously a lot of public anger, which which is probably misplaced about coronavirus, and we're seeing this sort of all around the world where where the public are blaming China for, for this pandemic, um, you know, you know, I mean, I guess no matter where it started, I mean, you know, it's sort of very unlikely anyone did this on, on purpose. So, um, you know, and that, that's going to be a real problem that's going to take a while to work through. I mean, many people are still in lockdown and they're frustrated and, and angry, and this might dissipate a bit when, when the world, hopefully when, not if, the world returns, returns to normal and some of that, um, anger, you know, subsides, and um, and we have seen from from what I'm hearing from my friends, uh, Chinese friends in Australia, there there was, you know, there has been some xenophobia and um, some pretty sort of unpleasant uh, experiences. So, so let's hope that all dissipates soon. Yes, indeed. Um, Jeff, would you like yeah, to I agree. With Mike, it's going to be a, it's going to be a tough ask, but mm. let's make a couple of points. I, I, well, I made the point about. Um, cultural programs before and mm. proposed a specific initiative. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's never going to be one thing, mm. um, but I think we can change the public mood to some extent uh, by more positive imaging, more positive engagement. A lot depends, of course, on China's behaviour itself. Um, and it's got to stop wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, I think more Chinese leadership in the global commons on things like climate change will help uh, to project... Uh, uh, a real uh, and, 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 and more positive image. Um, but it is going to be difficult. And the other thing I'd say, though, is bring back more Chinese students and tourists. And, and I think, again, there seems to be no discussion of this, but China basically has COVID under control as well as any state in Australia, and uh, as well as New Zealand. Um, and I think more credit needs to be given to what China's achieved in this respect, given that it's 1.4 billion people. I mean, it's one thing for the New Zealanders to um, manage it with 5 million people, but to manage it for 1.4 billion people seems to be something of a higher degree of difficulty. Um, and there's no reason to my mind why we should not now be discussing an Australia-China travel bubble. And I sincerely hope that it's not off the table simply because of the state of the bilateral relationship. Because that would be a massive lost opportunity for Australia. Uh, but certainly with the resumption of Chinese tourism and students, I think that will also contribute to improving the relationship, the image rather, China's image. I, I, I'm, I'm constantly not puzzled, but you know, yeah, so coronavirus is it's a, it's a handled so well in China, and uh, but there is hardly any reporting in Australia. Uh, occasionally, it's been reporting, and then it's always like a skewed and in, in a negative light. I mean, the fact is a fact. So they control the world. They control the world. Why can't you just report on it? Any comments on that, to Michael? You know, what? Why is reporters reluctant to report on the positive side? I've, which... I've, I've done a lot of reporting on. <laughs> China and coronavirus, and um, and every time I I write these stories about China has got. I mean, I, I went to Qing, the Qingdao beer festival a couple of months ago, and I write wrote this color piece about how you know China seems to have got this thing under control, and I got a lot of I got a lot of really nasty um, feedback <laughs> from and one from a doctor in Australia. They just didn't believe me. They thought I was um, you know spouting the, the the Communist Party's line, and I you know I, I really try and refrain from from doing that and um the fact is i was there and you know i'm not defending anything that happened in 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 early january in, in wuhan i think there were some huge mistakes made there but um but i think generally being there and watching it and unfold it they really did get it under control i mean no one in shanghai left their homes for for six weeks two two months three months and the place was really locked down. I mean, everyone did what they were told. Everyone stayed home, even when they didn't have to. You know, the, the contact tracing 
um, is is there. You know, the, the testing is just being done on such a widespread scale. It's I don't think there's a cover up, and I think I don't think the Chinese government want to cover up a, if, if there's a cluster or an outbreak because they know it's going to get out again and, and hurt their economy. So it's in no one's interest to do that. And and then we saw what happened in Beijing. There was an outbreak in the seafood market and, you know, they tested the entire city and, and locked, um, you know, locked a lot of uh, buildings down. So so that's sort of the way, the way you, d- you deal with it. I think that is a, you know, that is a, a positive story out of China, which um, not everyone wants to hear. Mm. Yes, which is very interesting because I read the story by Bill Berto and about the cockroaches and I think that's a very good story, but I can see that he, he was very carefully um, writing that story, very much from a humorous angle, but really, you know, about the real life in, in China. So, mm. which, um, yeah, which is, a, you know, it's a great stories like that, but it's a pity that... Yeah. Uh, yeah, not that many, you know, it seems like always the mindset is, all the story they want to read about China has to be negative. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, that's right. Look, there are there are a lot of negative stories in in China. So so don't get me wrong. In there, it, mm. it's very important that we report on those stories too. But but there's you know there, there's the other side and the, and the quirkier definitely. side and the lighter side. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely, mm. a- absolutely. And I think if, you know uh, negative stories, uh, negative not negative stories, just stories about negative sides. They should always be welcome and that people have obviously the idea about them. Last thing from Peter, and I think it's a comment, and so whether you want to comment on it. Uh, Jeff's point about the Chinese insecurity prompts a consideration of the Australian insecurity that can be seen playing out in the China threat industry as uh, Australia grapples with the breakdown of US leadership and the response to the US agenda in relation to China. Jeff, do you have any? Oh, I, would, I would just agree with Peter very much on that. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's sort of uh, their mirror images of insecurity mm-hmm. and feed on each other. And uh, again, that's why the public debate needs to be balanced and properly informed. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's a well over the time. It's a one and a half hours and it's such an interesting discussion. And again, we are so honoured to have a both of you and it's incredible to hear from you and, and the stories are from you. It's so important that rather than just to hear people reporting about what you say, you know, so it's so good to hear from you and then such a, um, you know, valuable and rare opportunity that we have. So I really would like to uh, thank you both and Jeff and Michael sincerely on behalf of uh, Western Sydney University and on behalf of the audience. And I would also like to thank our audience for your participation and for your attention and interest. And I hope discussions like this would help us, you know, understand a lot more about the relationship between China and Australia and and think of ways of improving. And I think the only improved relationship will benefit anyone. And uh, hopefully we will have a better world one day. Thank you again, Jeff, and thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hanjing, thanks. Bye.